Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first panel of the Atlantic Forum Spring Conference by the title An Alliance Bound to Lead, Converging Towards 2030. In this panel, we will discuss the continued relevance of the Atlantic Alliance today, the multiplicity of challenges it is facing and the transformation it is undergoing in order to meet the demands of an ever-changing security environment. A few days ago, on April 4th, NATO turned 72, an age where most of us would think about retiring. NATO instead is still in full activity and swarming with new ideas, projects, exercises. So the question is, why does NATO still matter? How did an alliance that was originally born to keep the Russians out, the Americans in, and the Germans down, manage to still be relevant in a world that is radically different, where, for example, Germany is a trusted ally? The first answer that can be given to this fundamental question is that NATO was born to guarantee all citizens within its territory one core service, security. In Maslow's hierarchy of needs, Safety and security come in terms of urgency right for physiological needs, such as drinking, eating, and sleeping. Being safe and secure is what makes everything else in your life possible. Feeling that your life and the lives of your loved ones are safe and threatened allows you to dream, to make plans for the future, to start a business or family, to take that interesting class at university, trusting that you will be prepared to see your projects succeed. In this sense, as citizens of the Euro Atlantic area, we are, we are used to peace and safety as a normal. In truth, we are so used to being safe that we are deeply troubled by any instance of unsafety and insecurity. However, it was not always like this. There was a time when a war was fought on the for five, seven years, and the Atlantic Alliance itself was created after four wars devastated Europe. 72 years of peace and security in the Euro area are, in fact, an unprecedented accomplishment. Virtually all of the will survive longer than the specific contingency that led to the creation. So, what makes NATO an exception? If I had to identify one single factor, it is the fact that when confronted with systemic shifts, NATO has not relied on past stories. On the contrary, it has been so far by learning to adapt. And in turn, this was made possible by the fact that NATO wasn't born only to confront a common threat, but also to reflect the common history, vision, and values of European and North American democracies and their intention to solve problems together. And so, at the end of the Cold War, NATO ceased to be a full-time nuclear defense, but it did not retire. It became something else. It became capable of planning, executing, and learning from out-of-area operations. It learned to confront new challenges, terrorism, insurgencies, and political instability. It discovered its own potential as a political diplomatic forum for discussing all matters concerning security and that significantly contribute to a number of agendas, from regional stability to nuclear disarmament. And now, times are changing again. As much as analysts uh, love the post-Cold War period, alas, it is currently coming to an end. Today, we are once again worried about great power rivalry, but we also have new worries, such as climate change and disruptive technologies. It is in this context that the NATO 2030 initiative was launched. And thus, it is once again the time to have a serious discussion about who we are, what we stand for, and how we want to embody it and communicate it forward. We need a NATO that is fast, young, versatile. We need it to look at cyber and space, at disinformation and political instability, beyond the sheer logic of power. And we needed to do so, even though the 30 NATO members do not always share the same perception or assessment. Arguably, the way to proceed is finding political unity among allies. But what does finding political unity mean? It is certainly not just the occasion for another summit or a photo. Finding political unity means deciding who we want to be in 2030 and agree on a plan together. It means rediscovering what bound the original 12 NATO members and what binds the, the 30 allies today, which is perfectly represented by the preamble language of the Washington Treaty. In Washington, NATO members resolved to unite the efforts not only for their collective defense, but also for the preservation of peace and security. 
What would this political unity look like? First, and perhaps most importantly, NATO, NATO and the North Atlantic Council as the principal political forum for discussing all regional and global political and security matters affecting North America and Europe. Secondly, it means rebalancing the transatlantic partnership. A recent NATO Defense College policy brief suggested, for example, that the US will need to avoid excessively pushing allies to take actions that are not coherent with their core values and threat perceptions. If anything, the US would need to be willing to conduct painstaking diplomacy to bring allies along on key geopolitical issues while accepting that it would be unable to do so policy preferences. Third, the worrisome pattern of democratic deterioration within the alliance should be promptly addressed. Otherwise, finding the political, political will through NATO's political centrality may be extremely difficult. Furthermore, the COVID-19 pandemic did not make the issue any easier to address. From the economic point of view, in fact, the recovery of NATO members is likely to be uneven. However, these centrifugal forces should not discourage NATO from pursuing the role as of the essential transatlantic political forum. On the contrary, this difficult situation underscores the urgency of the task that needs to be confronted in order to avert the risk that political independence may be threatened from within. Finally, it is important that NATO becomes increasingly capable to communicate its standing, values and projects to a number of different stakeholders. In fact, in an increasingly complex world where security challenges are more diverse and diffuse, it is especially important to engage with a broad set of stakeholders to take different perspectives into consideration and eventually to make NATO's goals and means understandable and fully transparent because hearts and minds must be one at home. In this sense, NATO needs to reflect on its role when it comes to transatlantic training and education, crucial to fostering cooperation and boosting interoperability. It needs to call upon the expert, think tank and academic community to provide their expertise and analysis in order to individuate emerging threats and challenges, as well as opportunities and good practices. Seminars like this one are also important because they allow young professionals like myself to ask questions to the people that are most qualified to answer, because they allow to start discussions that can be taken back to universities, think tanks and headquarters, and who knows, maybe translating into new projects. And finally, because they empower the new generation of leaders to be heard and to acquire a stake in their own future. Now, to translate these words into reality, I would like to introduce you my first speaker, Dr. Benedetta Berti. Since 2018, Dr. Berti serves as the head of policy planning in the office of the Secretary General at NATO. An Eisenhower Global Fellow and TED Senior Fellow, she has held positions at West Point, the Institute for National Security Studies, and the Tel Aviv University, among others. Actually, many others. I had trouble selecting the most relevant. Her areas of expertise include human security, internal conflict, integration of armed groups, post-conflict stabilization, and crisis management and prevention. Dr. Berti, uh, as you are heavily engaged in the NATO 2030 process, can you tell us more about its aim? What is the vision that is being pursued? And how should we imagine the NATO of year 2030? Absolutely. And thank you, Shari, for that very, uh, very kind introduction and also for laying the ground and for making it easier for us to come in and talk about the future, because, of course, you started the presentation by reminding us all of NATO's uh, seven decades of rich history. And I think you uh, very rightly pointed out um, two elements that are absolutely key to NATO's, uh, to NATO's continued strength and success. One, of course, is that uh, providing this unique um, platform for transatlantic coordination, consultation, and joint action around issues of common security and defense. And I very much agree with you that this is incredibly important. I would say uh, NATO is not just the primary platform, it is uh, essentially the only, it is a unique platform. It, ser it serves a unique role because it is truly the only, the only platform we have with, where North America and Europe sit at the same table on a daily basis to discuss their common security and defense, and that's very much part and parcel we need to preserve and strengthen. 
towards 2030. Of course, uh, NATO success is also grounded in the fact uh, that the main principle of the alliance is incredibly, is incredibly simple, yet incredibly powerful, one for all and one for one. Uh, and that's really the cohesion and strength uh, upon which our entire alliance is predicated. And then, and I think you, you summarize this very eloquently, uh, the ability of NATO to adapt and to respond to the changes in the security environment is what has ensured that the alliance has remained relevant throughout uh, the past seven decades. So with this just preacial uh, remarks, I would say we are well set to look at the decade ahead and to look at 2030. Uh, NATO 2030 is really uh, exactly about what, what, what you may think it is uh, here in the title, is about how do we make our strong alliance even stronger? How do we adapt uh, to the next decade? And how do we make sure that uh, confronting the manifold, different and diffuse challenges of the future, we're able to, uh, to remain a strong military alliance, to broaden our approach to security, to become even stronger politically and to take a more global approach while remaining a regional organization. Because, of course, NATO's first and foremost unchanging mission is exactly that, to provide for the security and defense of the almost uh, one billion uh, citizens that live in our 30 uh, allied nations. So uh, to make a very long story short, because I want to leave also uh, as much time as possible for, for the Q&A, but uh, over a year ago, at the last uh, leaders meeting, the last time the, the heads of state and government of our 30 allies met in London, they asked uh, the Secretary General to lead a process, a forward-looking process, uh, to provide concrete recommendations on how we meet the challenges of the future. This is the genesis of NATO 2030, and its conclusion will uh, come at the upcoming 2021 NATO summit, where allied leaders will agree a set of decisions, practical decisions, on how we continue to adapt our alliance. We all think that the next summit will be an incredibly important one. It will be an opportunity to open a new chapter in the transatlantic relations. It will be an opportunity to uh, recommit, reaffirm, and, re and build and continue to build our alliance even stronger. So with that, really, I would say predominantly um, positive and uh, bold level of ambition. Now we are working uh, inside uh, the alliance to uh, to come to the agreement in terms of what are what are we doing concretely to continue to adapt. And of course, we are in the middle of the process, so I cannot give you the full results yet, but I can tell you a little bit about where we're heading and what are our priorities. And here, uh, I, would, uh, I would start by saying that, of course, our bread and butter and our uh, core function and what we need to continue to do in order to, to remain um, relevant in 2030 is to remain a strong military alliance because that's uh, military strength is what underlines everything we do as, as a mil political military alliance. And here, of course, it is there's there's several uh, there's several important issues under this this framework. One is, of course, the importance of continuing to commit uh, to invest in our defense. And here, of course, we have a positive story because since 2014, uh, all allies have increased their defense spending and are continue to show that um, we are in a in an upward trajectory when it comes to showing uh, that we are uh, recommitting and strengthening our our efforts to to when it comes to deter deterrence and defense. At the same time, uh, looking to 2030, I think one of our priorities is to make sure we do even more together so that we fund together more of our exercise, of our activities, that we do more of, that, of our deterrence and defense activities together. Um, but of course, and this is something that the Deputy Secretary General already hinted to, uh, being strong militarily in 2030 also means being able to deal with a much broader range of threats that are more asymmetric and more diffuse. So that's why one of our key areas of investment in NATO 2030 is resilience. And I'm not going to repeat what the Deputy Secretary General so, uh, so eloquently explained, but I'll just mention that this is a second really important area of work where we want to step up uh, the, the work we are already doing. We already have baseline uh, requirements on resilience that we use 
to advise and work with allies so that we have a minimum level of shared resilience, but we should do and continue to do more in this, in this um, realm, recognizing that our potential adversary are really using all the tools in their toolbox in an integrated manner, in an integrated manner, from military to political to social to economic tools. So our approach to resilience must be equally broad and integrated. Uh, innovation and technology is another area where NATO 2030 has very ambitious goals. And the Deputy Secretary General mentioned, uh, mentioned the fact that we are uh, concretely advancing through a joint uh, strategy among our 30 allies on how to, uh, how to strengthen our investment in emerging and disruptive technologies. But with NATO 2030, we really want to uh, focus on how we encourage more transatlantic cooperations, more cooperation across the Atlantic when it comes to our investment in emerging and disruptive technologies, because we recognize that historically, our ability to deter and defend has been closely linked to our ability to maintain a technological superiority. So we will continue to invest very heavily in, a, in, in defense innovation and in, uh, specifically in emerging and disruptive technologies. So these are more of the, if you wish, uh, more expected areas of focus of NATO 2030 because they focus on NATO's military aspects. But of course, with NATO 2030, we're also really looking out to make NATO even stronger politically. And that means that we recognize, and exactly as you said at the beginning, uh, Shari, we recognize that this is the only platform that the transatlantic community has to coordinate, consult, and act together when it comes to security and defense. So we need to really uh, use it to its full potential. And of course, uh, this is especially important as if I look at the next decade, I think one of the key dynamics that we cannot ignore is that of growing geopolitical competition and growing pressure uh, being placed on the international rules-based order and, a word of, and, and I believe in a world of growing uh, competition and advancing authoritarianism, it would be even more important for us to use NATO politically to agree common approaches and common ways to deal with the systemic challenges we face. So that's another really important area of NATO 2030. And finally, I'm really uh, summarizing here because there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, uh, I would say, substance on all of these priorities, but uh, for the sake of time, I'm, I'm, I'm just giving you the gist. And the, a very important third area of work that is very much complementary to the work we're doing to strengthen NATO politically is for the alliance to really be able to take a broader, a more global approach. And again, more global approach doesn't mean changing the nature of NATO as a regional organization, but it does mean recognizing that the security challenges we face are global. And that, and they require a global approach and an integrated toolkit that really uses military and non-military tools. So, what do I mean with a more global approach? I mean, first, I mean first that we are taking concrete steps to um, increase the work we do when it comes to protecting the rules-based international order, including by working more with like-minded partners. Uh, for example, uh, NATO has increased in, the, in recent years its work with its Asia-Pacific partners, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and Korea. And of course, that's, that's I think, a very good example uh, to think about how a regional alliance can tackle global challenges by working with like-minded partners. Of course, uh, I, when talking about tackling global challenges, I didn't mention that we are, of course, also invested in uh, NATO's ability to play its part when it comes to the impact of climate change on security. The Alliance just recently agreed a uh, practical uh, agenda on climate change and security and has the very much, uh, a num is very much in the midst of implementing many measures that, that are aimed to make sure that we're able to fully understand, fully prepare for, fully adapt for the security impact of climate change, and also looking at how we can mitigate and contribute to combating climate change by um, being more energy efficient, more investing in green technologies. And of course, all of this is also good for our operational effectiveness. And these are just some of the areas, of course, that there is much more work behind NATO 2030, 
but I think it gives you a little bit of the breadth and depth of the uh, this debate that are being uh, held right now at NATO and it also gives you a sense of direction. And the sense of direction is to prepare NATO, to prepare our alliance for a world of increasing geopolitical competition, a world in which we need to be able to stand even closer together as allies and as democracy, and a world in which we need to be able at the same time, so simultaneously, to tackle existing threats, to deter and defend and in the conventional realm, but at the same time to really deal with a broader set of security challenges. So that's the work. Uh, that's NATO 2030 in a nutshell. And I think it's, it gives us a very strong blueprint to look at how we are continuing to adapt as an alliance uh, in the next decade and beyond. And I'll stop here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Berti, for a well-rounded response depicting a well-rounded process that touches on every aspect of NATO, the political, economic, military domains, but also to renovate I would uh, like to introduce my second speaker, Professor Sven Biskop, uh, who is the director of the European the World Programme at Egmont Royal Institute for International Relations in Brussels, which he joined in 2002. And he is also a professor at Ghent University. His research and teaching focus on the strategies of the European Union, NATO, and their member states. And because of this, uh, my question for you is two faceted. Uh, the broad question is what are the main challenges uh, that NATO faces in ensuring political cohesion and unity throughout the alliance? The first aspect is how does the transatlantic partnership, uh, especially taking into account that, that as it cyclically happens, the two shores of the Atlantic have been very far away in the past few years. And the second aspect of the question is uh, taking into account the degradation of democratic standards within certain NATO members, uh, something that I mentioned in my introductory speech. Is it time for the North Atlantic Council to become a forum for discussion related to those NATO members who fail to, uh, quote in the Washington Treaty, safeguard the freedom, common heritage and civilization of their peoples founded on the principles of democracy, individual liberty and the rule of law. The floor is yours. Thank you very much and uh, thank you for having me on this having conference. Me on this conference. Um, I think there are two, uh, and I combined my answer to the two questions in, into one. Um, because I think the, the second question about democratic backsliding in some allies is very much linked to the future of political cohesion. I have the feeling on the one hand there are issues such as precisely democratic backsliding that NATO ought to be paying more attention to but isn't if it wants to maintain its cohesion. On the other hand I have the feeling that NATO is importing issues onto its agenda that are divisive that are perhaps not really NATO topics or not primarily. So, to turn to both uh, in turn, one, um, democratic backsliding is indeed um, a major issue and I think it's very damaging for the political cohesion of the alliance. Um, the alliance did not start as an alliance of democracies. So when NATO was created and, and later on, actually some authoritarian states were invited into the alliance for strategic reasons. But that has evolved, of course. So, NATO, I think, now today is not just about the defense of the territory and the sovereignty of, its, of the allies, it's also the defense of the democratic system of each of the allies. But, but what does that mean then if one allied country yeah, begins to undo its democracy? Um, I think the other democratic allies you know, uh, would be hard put to convince their public opinion to put their armed forces at risk to defend an authoritarian-like uh, regime in another NATO ally, because that's not the point of NATO. So I think those uh, leaders and, and, and actors who are going back on democracy should perhaps realize that they are also somehow undermining the cohesion of the alliance and thus putting their security at risk. Now, I would posit that for those NATO allies that are also EU member states, that the main responsibility to maintain democratic standards lies with the Union. And the Union also has the most uh, tools there. The Union, too, woke up rather too late to this problem, uh, is now taking measures, but it's going slowly, slow, yeah, slowly and, and very painfully, and I think ought to, ought to be much more severe 
vis-à-vis uh, -vis, uh, undemocratic acts by governments in Hungary and Poland, uh, for example. But I do also think, as you suggested, um, Sherry, that it should be an item for the North Atlantic Council, uh, including, of course, for those NATO allies such as Turkey that are not uh, not EU member states, and that we ought to be much more explicit about this. I mean, I understand, of course, that if you uh, if you're in the NAC or if you're working for NATO, that your concern is to make sure that NATO operates and that you can't import uh, each and every problem between allies in, onto the NATO agenda. But I think this concerns the very functioning of the alliance, and, and I think NATO must much more explicitly deal with democratic backsliding among its members. Now, secondly, the other side uh, of this, there is a, a cyclical tendency also, that is, um, every so many years, somehow there is the idea that, that NATO is, using, is losing relevance. Somehow people begin to fear that. Um, which is basically meaningless because, you know, um, uh, as, as was very well explained, the NATO, the relevance of NATO is obvious. It's Article 5 and it's the, the collective defense guarantee. So there is no doubt about its relevance. But somehow, uh, every so many years, some people begin to fear for relevance. And the answer is always the same. Oh, uh, let's broaden the scope of NATO. Let's put more topics uh, on, on the agenda. And then NATO begins to... Uh, discuss uh, climate change, migration, uh, energy, uh, technology, uh, geoeconomics, uh, and, now, and now also China. Now, of course, the allies must discuss everything uh, among themselves in NATO that they think is of relevance uh, to their security and defense. But that doesn't mean that in each of these areas, it is them to the NATO apparatus to develop a policy and to begin to write papers about it. So I think Sometimes we, we conflate the alliance, which is the bond between the allies, with the apparatus, the NATO bureaucracy, to, to, to use that term, in, in a non-pejorative way. On many of these issues, actually, NATO yeah, has no instruments uh, and so has, does not have the capacity to shape policy. So I think we must somehow develop the habit that we may discuss some issues uh, in the NAC because we think we have relevance for security and defense, but then decide that the best way to take action on them is probably by the individual allies or in many cases on the European side by the European Union rather than by the NATO, the NATO apparatus. And I'll, I'll, I'll take two examples. Um, one is China. China is obviously a major strategic issue, the rise of China. Uh, but the way that, that uh, we, we pos position ourselves vis-à-vis -vis China today, that's very much an issue of foreign policy and of geoeconomics. Um, and so, in my view, it is logical that on the European side of the Atlantic, the European Union takes the lead in developing what is a foreign policy towards China, and that the NATO apparatus deal with China to the extent that it monitors the de development of Chinese military capabilities, to the extent that it monitors the, um, the implications for NATO defense, but it basically plays a complementary role to the leading role, which must be played by, on the one hand, of course, Washington, and on the other hand, Brussels, but EU Brussels. And this was in a way became evident when two weeks ago the NATO foreign ministers met, uh, talked a lot about China, did they not actually mention it in the declaration? But instead, Secretary of State Blinken met afterwards with the EU high representative uh, Borrell, uh, where they opened, uh, finally started the, the EU-US dialogue on China that was already announced under the Trump administration, but proved impossible. I think that's exactly it. So. My, my humble advice to the U.S. would be uh, don't try to channel everything through NATO. If it's not primarily a defense issue, speak directly with the EU if you want to get things done. And the same applies to resilience. I can see the point of, of setting sort of standards in, in, uh, uh, in NATO when it comes to resilience. For There are these seven areas that NATO has identified where resilience is, is key. Uh, but, but at the same time, it is up to individual allies or, in the case of uh, the EU member states, up to the European Union to decide on how to achieve resilience. Resilience is very much about geoeconomics. Eh? That's the main aspect of it. It's about, um, uh, how, it's about finding a balance between an open market but protecting sensitive sectors. To put it very concretely, it is not up to NATO or it is not up to the US to decide which company from which country can invest on the single market of the European Union. That's an EU-only decision. So again, in resilience, I think NATO has the complementary role to play, the supporting role, the leading role, 
is to be played by um, by the European Union. So if, if I conclude, I would say that NATO's relevance and cohesion uh, is a matter of its focus on its core task, at which it is very well, uh, and that is uh, collective defense. So I think maybe it is time that we come somehow to a more precise division of labor. For a long time I thought the division of labor between NATO and the EU was not a good idea, because you know the world is complex and the moment you devise a division of labor, then something will happen that doesn't fit into it. But the result of not having a clear division of labor is, is perennial neutral suspicion. So I would say, you know, um, let, let's, let's divide the roles. Um, let's make it clear that the aspiration to European strategic autonomy does not now extend to collective territorial defense. That will be done within NATO. And that should keep, uh, sit, that should set everybody's mind at ease who fears that European strategic autonomy might undermine the alliance. It will not. But within the alliance, I think the European allies uh, should step up their effort and contribute a much larger share of the NDPP targets. Um, when it comes to resilience, however, if you want the non-military part of Article 5, there for me it's obvious that the EU should take the lead and that NATO should play the supporting role. Secondly, when it comes then to non-Article 5 operations, crisis management outside NATO and EU territory, there I would say put the EU in the lead, because this is the this is basically the EU's southern flanks. NATO is, you know, genetically uh, watching to the east, is watching Russia. And, and I think for NATO, the south will always be, be a sideshow in spite of uh, regular symbolic utterances about it. So put the EU in charge of crisis management on the southern flank, which is, you know, not, not so much a defense issue as, as deterrence of Russia, uh, it's a much more integrated uh, integrated approach. And finally, um, integrate defense planning and capability development. Um, NATO and the EU are now, now both trying to guide their members' um, defense planning and capability development. That obviously doesn't work so well. So I would say the EU does need an, an, a level of ambition to decide for its task of crisis management on the southern flank which capabilities does it require. But integrate as such into the NATO defense planning process and set some collective targets within the NDPP for the for the EU. Um, these are, of course, all things that are easy to say for me as an academic, uh, but it's our job, I think, to um, ask the difficult questions and to to put proposals on the table that might not be politically feasible today, uh, but that might be feasible uh, one day. So thanks again for giving me the opportunity to take part. Thank you. For and I do agree that there is uh, this preoccupying tendency that every few years we see a re-emergence of the NATO in crisis literature. But as per your conclusion that this usually leads to broadening NATO scope, this actually resonates really well with the question I had in mind for Dr. Kovalchikova, so I actually can introduce her to our audience. Uh, she obtained her PhD in international relations with a focus on security threats, and she currently is a program manager and fellow at the Alliance for Securing Democracy at the German Marshall Fund's Brussels office. So the question I uh, wanted to ask you is, how does NATO review its strategic concept and chart a common course for the Alliance? And should NATO update uh, its strategic concept to include a, a larger variety of threats more specifically in order to meet the objectives of the 2030 benchmark? And a third aspect of this question is where there seems to be further potential for NATO to get involved. How to address, uh, in other words, the uh, emerging challenges that we are witnessing in this years? Thank you. The, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sherry, and uh, it's a pleasure to be part of this uh, conversation today. Um, I'll try to address all, all three questions. Um, talking about the strategic concept and do we need it? Is it, uh, is it necessary to update? I think it's very important that NATO is thinking, is uh, having this uh, 2030 reflection process, but any other reflection process, especially uh, as it's been a decade since the strategic concept has been adopted in uh, 2010. Uh, is very important and it's um, it's necessary to, to consider that there have been changes in our security challenges and they have uh, they have also evolved in the ways that in 
impacts the institutional capacities and needs to address them. So I think it's a it's a quite a timely and also uh, necessary to reflect on those changes and the evolution of the threats and the breadth and also the depth of the threats that have been um, currently present and will be also in the future and think in a strategic way, not only 10 years, but also further this, uh, especially in the sector of technology and innovation, we are talking uh, uh, very, very much about something that is already maybe tomorrow, all that is today. So we have to think very much strategically about the technological advancement. So yes, the short answer would be we do need to consider wider spectrum of the threats. Uh, I take the point uh, of um, of uh, Professor Biscop about the fact of the focus and uh, making sure that we are effective in addressing them. But I don't think it's exclusive in in some way. I do agree that we do have to have understanding of the division of labor to a certain extent, uh, but also there is a lot of uh, complementary effort and there are also a lot of, I think, overlap in challenges. So sometimes I do think that we need to also consider um, more, I would say, flexibly of uh, which challenges uh, we can address through which uh, platforms and tools uh, and think together uh, when to use them and where are the most appropriate, but not shy away from uh, developing those tools uh, and having them ready um, uh, when, whenever the occasion arises. Uh, second, perhaps, I think this is this effort, this process is part of deterrence uh, technique as well, showing that I think NATO is not only thinking, but is willing to address wider spectrum of changes if it touches upon the security of the member states, uh, is also a deterrence mechanism to show that NATO is capable and wants to be even more capable to deter any aggression. And uh, this is not only, I would say, in the typical military space, but we have seen during the pandemic that also uh, certain actors have increased their activity and assertiveness in the information space, for example. And these are many times uh, connected efforts used in combination with other tools that may ultimately lead to either undermining our democracy, democratic institutions and processes, but also security. And I think it's important to take those um, activities, uh, this assertiveness, uh, as for example, we have seen also by China during the pandemic, seriously, and, uh, and address uh, also the threats that may be connected to the de dependency, either being technological dependency, energy dependency or economic uh, dependency and uh, we cannot just uh, I think um, um, I think it's important to understand and th and realize that these economic uh, uh, tools are also having many times spillover effects to political area or the security area more concretely I think it's quite uh, quite important that NATO has been uh, uh, recognizing also the challenges in the in the tech space and um, the need to innovate not only in technology in the civilian space but also in the military space. As many times, this civilian military domain is much more intertwined uh, with the technological development, and um, I think this is one of the areas where there is a lot of potential for NATO to further build uh, the capabilities, but also innovate and be more resilient. And perhaps on the resilience, because uh, it's been mentioned also by the Deputy Secretary General in his opening remarks by um, by my previous uh, speakers uh, here, uh, colleagues uh, on the panel, but I do think that uh, resilience is also quite a wider um, uh, category that uh, we need to uh, think also more holistically about it. It's also about societal resilience. It's also about um, uh, building trust in our democratic systems, in our authoritative uh, institutions, in our governments, which at the same time, I think, does need to come with the accountability of those governments. So uh, NATO has an opportunity to, um, to lead by example, showing, and I do agree that it's important to also um, recognize certain uh, vulnerabilities and work on them and improve existing uh, uh, vulnerabilities in our systems internally, domestically, in order to be uh, stronger, but also uh, create this credibility and the trust in the longer term. So the, the citizens uh, 
uh, can fully uh, trust in and uh, recognize, appreciate the democratic legitimacy and the legitimacy of these organizations that have been there for, uh, in the NATO case, over seven decades, but also of the EU and other institutions together, uh, to be able to defend them and to uh, bring stability and keep and remain the stability, but also uh, ensure that they are able to cooperate and they do cooperate and they improve. And um, as Benedetta nicely put it, they also uh, kind of introduce Introduce these blueprints and uh, set certain standards um, that can be followed uh, uh, by either uh, the governments, uh, also the partner countries, but we can also learn a lot from the partner countries. So I do not want to uh, elaborate much further because I would really enjoy also having some uh, Q and A uh, part on it. But just to uh, just to end on a little bit uh, positive note with the potential. I do think that actually in the connecting of the alliances uh, and democratic alliances, especially in partners, there is a lot of strength. And therefore, I think there is a lot of potential for NATO to really enhance its uh, role, especially with the with the ambition of having more of a global um, uh, outreach or uh, outlook, uh, as it's been defined also in the Secretary General's annual report, by really strengthening these relationships with the partners, be it uh, other countries in the in the Pacific or Western Balkans or other regions that have been uh, very much close partners already for for a while, but also our experiences. Uh, experiencing challenges that NATO can help address, um, but also the other organizations such as EU, uh, African Union, other, uh, other organizations NATO have been already working with. I think there is a lot of potential to actually deepen and strengthen those relationships uh, going forward as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Kovalchikova. And we actually have time for a final round of question. Um, the first one goes to Dr. Berti. And uh, saying that NATO's nature is that of a regional defense alliance is certainly uh, legitimate. So um, the question still regards uh, the broadening scope of NATO, touching on a number of different issues from establishing global partnerships to tackling climate change. And uh, I want to ask you, do you think that we are still essentially tackling security is just that the concept of security changed? Uh, like today, there's a lot of talking about of human security. And I think that uh, explained in common words is what I was mentioning before about uh, being not, not only physically safe, but also feeling psychologically safe and being able, being able to plan for the future, to hope and to know that everything will be eventually all right, that there is no threat coming at you. Thank you. The short answer is yes, and but then let me elaborate it a little bit. And I think that uh, it is absolutely true that uh, we are looking, NATO's job is very clear, NATO's mission is very clear, it's the security and defense of our allies. Um, but what does it take to guarantee that security and defense, of course, changes as the security environment changes? And in a world in which, of course, the lines between civil and military, peace and war, uh, is much more blurred, it is obvious that the only way to secure uh, our territory and protect our population is to broaden our approach to security. So on that, I completely agree. I also want to say, historically, we have never been just about territorial security. Uh, if even in our 1949 uh, founding treaty, and in its uh, even our funding uh, forefathers, in a way, had, or, had, had already talked about uh, NATO being about the protection and the defense of the territory, the people, the values, and the way of life. And that's the way of life is the expression that is already there. So, in a way, uh, I would say, uh, I, I would say this very much. It's not about reinventing the wheel, and I agree that we shouldn't. It is about it, it is about sticking to our to our initial mandate. Uh, but I do believe that it's very important to do keep the focus. At the same time, I recognize that there are issues where 
case, in ignoring the security implication would simply not be feasible for us. For example, climate change has very real security implications, but climate change also has very real implication on our army's function, on what type of equipment we need, on what type of planning we need, on what type of uh, climate resilience we need for our installations and facilities. And of course, we need to take care of it because ultimately we need to be able to deploy and operate uh, in a world in which the climate is changing and creating an environment, an operational environment that is wilder, wetter, windier, and more complex. So, of course, we cannot be the first responder when it comes to climate change, but at the same time, not adapting to the security implications will not will will ensure we lo will ensure we lose a relevance and that we cannot afford. So, I would say that's the balance, and it's a it's an important one to strike. I think our compass needs to be always our mission, the defense of the security, the defense and security of the transatlantic uh, space. And of course, we have those three core tasks that kind of lay out very nicely what we need to do. And uh, and those are, of course, as, as reminded, defense and deterrence, but they're also crisis management and they're also cooperative security, which really it means working with our partners and really means working more on what you would call the softer side of security as well. So I think in doing that, we're actually very much in keeping with the essence of, of NATO. Um, but uh, I do recognize there is always saving, there's, there's, a, there's a strong importance in maintaining a focus. And then I would just say that I really appreciated the comments about how we really need to continue to work closely with the European Union when it comes to these issues. I couldn't agree more. Uh, at the same time, of course, we also need to be to be to remember uh, from the point of view of NATO, a very basic fact that 90 percent of uh, 90 percent of NATO citizens live in a EU country. Sorry, 90 percent, 90 percent of uh, Ninety percent of EU citizens li are also living in a NATO country, but only roughly forty percent of our citizens live in a EU country. So let me repeat: roughly more than sixty percent of NATO citizens, the citizens we are sworn to protect, do not live in a NATO country. So of course we need to think. We need to look at issues like resilience. Of course we need to look at issues where, uh, where, where of course we need to protect uh, our almost 1 billion population. Of, and of course, of, when, when we think about the security and the defense of Europe, it's very difficult to have that conversation without thinking about the role of the United States and Canada uh, in the West, the role of the United Kingdom, the role of Norway in the North, and the role of Turkey in the South. So of course, we have to have that transatlantic perspective. Uh, but at the same time, it's incredibly important that we work together as, as like-minded organizations. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. And my uh, next question goes to Professor Biscop. As uh, Dr. Bertie just mentioned, there's a lot of geographical overlapping between NATO and the EU. Uh, but where's the area of overlapping for interests and what's uh, the best platform or the best forum for developing eventually a synergy between NATO and the EU? thing to mention is of course citizen of the EU one is not the citizen of NATO eh? I'm a Belgian citizen therefore I'm also a citizen of the EU and as a citizen of the EU I have direct rights and EU legislation directly applies in Belgium so that that is my daily life I am not the citizen of, of NATO Belgium is a member of NATO and I think that is a key difference that is perhaps not always clear to people who do not live in an EU member state you're not you know, your country is not the member of the EU like you're a member of NATO or another organization. You you really are the EU and legislation is made that, that has a permanent impact on, on your daily life. So in that sense, there is somehow a qualitative difference. Um, I think there are two two dimensions that, that need to be addressed if you really want to uh, end the perennial beauty contest between the, the bureaucracy of the two organizations. Um, the, the first layer is, is the eternal dispute uh, about Cyprus and, and, and Greece and Turkey, who basically yeah, abuse the fact that, that um, one is in uh, uh, NATO, uh, but, but, uh, but not in the EU, 
uh, and who abused that fact to block EU NATO cooperation forever. And Cyprus is the only EU member state that is neither an ally nor a partner of NATO, and, and that makes uh, any truly thorough cooperation between EU security and defence policy and NATO impossible. Um, frankly, I think that if we wanted to, we could solve this. Uh, I know that, that Turkey forever blocks this, but if, if the leading nations within NATO would really want to solve it, I'm quite sure that, that they could lean sufficiently on Ankara to solve it. So I fear that some people, both sides of the Atlantic, also find it quite convenient that we cannot really solve EU NATO cooperation and they are hiding behind that. But even if the Turkey issue, the Cyprus issue would go away tomorrow, uh, we would still not be there because in the end the question is who does, who does what? And, and, and neither side of the Atlantic is very clear here. The United States continuously asks the Europeans do more, spend more on defense. But whenever and then the Europeans do something that, that seems to perhaps threaten U.S. leadership or U.S. dominance, then the Americans immediately push back. Um, so there's a permanent ambiguity there in the American position. But there's also a permanent ambiguity in the European position. In the, in the EU context, many talk about strategic autonomy, uh, but they don't want to be too autonomous. They, they want to be autonomous, but not so autonomous that the US would still not come and save them if they get in trouble. And, and so as long as both sides remain ambiguous about what it is that they really want, we will, we will never have a really thorough and constructive uh, cooperation between the two organizations. Again, I reiterate my point. In my view, the way to solve this is to, to clarify which organization plays the leading role and which plays a supporting role in, in, different, uh, in different areas. And once that is uh, accepted, and that is for member states to decide, not for the apparatus to decide, then one could eventually hope for, a, um, for an end to the beauty contest, which, which wastes a lot of time and energy. I mean, I make a living writing about it. Uh, but I could also make a living writing about successful cooperation. So I think that would be rather better. Thanks again. Uh, thank you. You actually put forward a really interesting perspective that is that taking is into account the specific positions of the member states, whether they belong to the European Union, NATO or both. Now, we have talked at length about um, maintaining political unity. And if there is one thing that can uh, actually bring down political stability, political unity and unity of vision, that is disinformation. So I would like to ask Dr. Kovalchikova, uh, how does uh, NATO engage with diverse stakeholders to ensure that every citizen is protected against the threat? And as I know that COVID was a particularly difficult time, uh, how has the information space uh, been used by malign actors during the pandemic and why it's important to address it? Thank you. Thank you for this question. Um, uh, NATO 2030 reflection process, but also the session that we have today, the whole Spring Conference Atlantic Forum is organized and is part of the, um, um, the, the role and the importance of raising awareness uh, across different audiences. Uh, a young generation is one of them. Uh, uh, geographical different audiences matter, as, matter well. as well. Generational, of course, different groups, marginalized groups as well that are being targeted uh, by disinformation or just need to also be able to have access to information to better um, orientate themselves within the topics like anyone else. I think this is part of the efforts that NATO has been already doing and this process is uh, an evidence of that. There have been many others and I am uh, confident there will be more in the future as well. And the engagement if, uh, with the audience is more actively is, is I think uh, critical, especially when, uh, for example, during the pandemic now, we have been very much uh, uh, all isolated within our spaces and the physical interaction has been limited. Uh, on one hand, it creates the opportunity to really reach many more people through the different communication channels that they have been consuming during this pandemic as a lot of people are spending much more time, I think, online than when um, we are in a normal or so-called normal circumstances. On the other hand, there are also challenges of how to really build these uh, trusted uh, partnerships or audiences uh, for them to really be able to relate to the people, to the authoritative voices that they are hearing and see 
seen on the screens, which um, uh, which during the kind of uh, let's say more normal pre-pandemic pre times created this kind of bond that people perhaps were able to uh, to reach out and have more direct access to also certain uh, uh, leaders talking or experts uh, talking about certain issues. Now we are kind of dependent on the technology that, as I mentioned, provides opportunities, but also perhaps uh, can lead to certain distance. And therefore, it's very important to try to reach through different communication channels, through different tools, uh, through different languages. I think it's extremely important to keep in mind that we have um, this um, the beauty of uh, various languages, but also the responsibility to really use them to address the audiences and the citizens in different, here in this case, member states, but also other countries uh, to share our messaging and uh, to connect with them. And I think these are... Uh, these are opportunities and challenges at the same time, depending on how they are used. And uh, another, I think, important um, point here that I have seen already NATO doing and other organizations, but also can be done more by, by anyone, all of us, is to tailor the messages and um, communicate them not only through the channels people co consume, but also the way they connect information and connect the dots and through the issues that they really matter to them. So sometimes I think issues may be very abstract to them uh, because security questions may be, may be very maybe too big, but uh, when it's connected to their daily lives, uh, why does climate change matter to their daily life? Why is it really impacting the, the security of the citizens um, or why uh, why we need to build the societal resilience in order to um, make sure that, uh, for example, during the election time, but beyond as well, uh, people understand uh, if there is certain information manipulation and are resilient to it and or, or at least can detect it, identify it and make an informed decision. Um, uh, when, when being aware um, to and exposed to the, to the challenges that such an information manipulation can bring. Um, and perhaps to your last point, uh, how was it used during the pandemic and uh, why does it matter to address it? Well, we have seen that various actors, be it domestic or foreign actors, have really used the opportunity of uh, uh, frame the messaging in the ways that was convenient. For example, in the case of the foreign actors, we are not very much surprised. We were not surprised to see that Russia has been very active in the information space, but China has become much more active in the information space. And the fact that uh, there are a lot of messages about the virus, the origins, the spread, uh, the treatments, uh, all of this also became a little bit of a geopolitical um, discussion uh, to shift the blame or to, to see who is uh, responsible for what and potentially even divide uh, certain member states. Uh, we have seen that uh, one of the top Kremlin's messages that let media were uh, basically attacking NATO or EU and how divide, divided they are or how they need to coordinate. Yes, they do need to coordinate more, but seeing one message exponentially more uh, amplified also um, uh, to a certain extent, uh, of course, manipulates the perception of such a message and gives it uh, other importance than if it would be in the in the real uh, context uh, and uh, within the without the uh, fake or, or let's say inauthentic uh, amplification. So. I think this is important to, to recognize that we are uh, facing uh, also new challenges because new tools are being used. There are also potentially uh, um, new uh, opportunities that we can also address and use for our own um, interest, uh, being it uh, for NATO or EU, uh, raising of uh, understanding and awareness. But we also have to be realistic about the way that uh, this is happening and make people, our society, uh, resilient and aware of that and uh, look maybe for the ways how to address it in a, through the trainings, through the awareness campaigns or through institutional settings that I think need to be adapted to better address these also kind of newer or growing challenges, be it, for example, in the information space. Thank you, Dr. Kovalchikova. And you are absolutely right that we are living in times that may be confusing. Uh, however, I regret that our times together uh, is uh, coming to an end. I want to thank you once again for your time and for the great opportunity of interviewing you. I must say that I really enjoyed this heartfelt conversation and it has been a long, long time. And thank you for uh, telling us uh, young professionals and scholars doing to guarantee her safety and security today and going forward to 2030. I will now leave the floor to the next panel.
Thank you. Bye.